So we are concluding our series on the Gospel of Mark. And uh, I just want to recap uh, briefly what we've been talking about so far. In the first message, I highlighted what Mark's theme is, uh, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that he came preaching the good news of the kingdom of God. Uh, the second week, we asked the question, whose side are we on? We observed that Jesus didn't choose any of the sides uh, that were present in his day, uh, religious or political or otherwise, but he called all people to repent and believe and follow him to stand by his side. Last week, we uh, looked at the question, is Jesus the Messiah you actually want? And we, we saw that Jesus spoke a very radical message, a message that was contrary not only to what people were expecting, but contrary to what people would want, uh, speaking about power through serving, humbling yourself, being willing to die, uh, turning the other cheek, these are not the kinds of things that people were looking for from the Messiah. So the question is, is Jesus the Messiah that you are looking for? And today we're going to uh, finish this series by looking at the third section of the Gospel of Mark. Um, the uh, uh, picture here is from the Bible Project video. Uh, the three sections uh, correspond to the th last uh, three messages of this series. And today we're looking in particular at how the whole story comes to this point of the cross and the importance of the cross in answering the question, who is Jesus? He is the Messiah, the Son of God. What kind of Messiah are we talking about? Power, authority, swords, armies? No, he comes by way of the cross. The cross is the heart of the message of Mark. And I would suggest of all the early Christians, Paul put it this way, uh, I preach Christ crucified. That's my message. And you'll notice Mark really wants to drive this point home he does not even focus on the birth stories of Jesus. Not that they don't have a place, but that's not the message he's trying to communicate. Nor does he have an elaborate, extended explanation of what happens after the resurrection. The story just kind of ends. Resurrection and then that's it. It's as if Mark is saying, if you want to know who this Messiah, Son of God is, look at his death. Because that tells you everything about what kind of Messiah he is. So I'm going to use this message to explain to you why I am a Jesus follower. Part of this is, is personal testimony. I can't get into the elaborate or extended version of my story, but I was born and raised, raised in uh, a religious Christian family, and I went through all of the ordinary steps, Sunday school, catechism, profession of faith, uh, I under, was taught all the beliefs of the Christian church, what we believe, um, and I was led to this point of believing. I wanted to, felt called to become a minister uh, in the church, in the Christian Reformed Church, so I went to seminary, and I was, uh, my mind was filled with all the information and facts about what it is to be a Christian, what it is to believe, and I passed all the tests uh, so that I was solidly Christian and Reformed, that I could be a minister. But through all this time, I felt that something was missing. Now, I can't get into the whole story, but it led to a point of crisis. I had a crisis of faith uh, somewhere around 10 years into ministry. I actually reached the point where I decided I am going to just, I can't believe any of this for a moment. And I, and I called it all in the question. I don't believe in anything. No, I'm a minister at this point, so it's kind of hard to keep doing my work, but I did my best while I wrestled with this question. And the first question I asked myself is, do I even believe there is a God? Now, that was a journey in itself, but I came to this point where I decided, yeah, I, I can't get past. Somehow, some way, there is a God. Once I reached that point, the next question I struggled with is, what kind of God? I mean, there's all kinds of ideas that people have about God. There's all kinds of religious ideas, all kinds of teachers who paint pictures of God. There's personal gods and impersonal gods. Uh, the force uh, is a form of God. Uh, all kinds of... And how do I decide? Again, through that journey, I looked at these different presentations of God, and for one reason or another, I landed on the Jesus presentation of God. And I invested myself in understanding who this 
God was as Jesus presented him. Now, I'm not saying it's contrary to what the rest of the Bible says, but I couldn't understand the rest of the Bible until I understood what Jesus was saying. And it's because of my understanding of Jesus that I came to a point where I could say, this is a God I can believe in, and this is a way I can follow. And I chose and I made a decision, I'm going to be a Jesus follower. I'm going to shape my life after who Jesus is, what he taught, and how he lived. Now this picture, you've seen me use it before, and it's a picture you can actually find in Jerusalem. Uh, it's, there's a Polish church in Jerusalem. It's found at the third station of the cross. That is, when Jesus went through his journey to the cross, there was these multiple stops, and they, there's little chapels along the way. This is the third station where Jesus stumbles, uh, where the cross is too heavy. So that's what you see when you go in. It's just a very simple side building. You go in, you see this. But as you leave the building, there's Jesus carrying the cross for us. As you leave the building, this is what's over the door. The Jesus who carries the cross, carried the cross for us, invites us to carry the cross with him. And this picture captures for me what why, why the cross is, for me, the heart of the message. Why I wear a cross and, and how that convinces me of what I believe and why I believe it. So what I want to do now is use two uh, readings from the last chapters of Mark, Mark 11 through 16. And the first one is Mark 14, 17 to 25. And instead of reading it, you're welcome to follow along. We're going to watch the video of this part of the story of Mark. Mark 14, 17 to 25. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, Truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely you don't mean me. It is one of the twelve, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. Yes. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly, I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine, until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So the first and most important reason why I concluded that I could believe in the God that Jesus Christ was teaching and, and preaching was because in Jesus we see what God is like. In Jesus, we see what God is like. At the beginning of the gospel, we see uh, Mark introducing Jesus through John the Baptist. And you may recall the words, I send a message ahead of you who will prepare your way, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Now, this is part of a larger section, Isaiah 40 through 55, where Isaiah is speaking about how God himself will step into the world to set things straight, how God will come 
and all eyes will see him. In fact, a little bit further, um, Isaiah talks about a few verses later from this reading in Isaiah 40. Uh, you who bring good news to the towns of Judah say, Behold your God. Get rid of all the barriers, flatten all of the hills, make it plain and straight so that God can come. So when John the Baptist is announcing Jesus, the people are hearing this and saying, Okay, God's going to come. God's finally going to step in. God, through his Messiah, is going to straighten up this messed up world. So Jesus comes. When Jesus comes, it's the same thing as if God himself comes into the world. What does it look like if God were coming to come in the world right now? If God were to come, we'd say, oh, everything would change. You know, No, it would look exactly like it looked when Jesus came. Because Jesus came to show us what God is like. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. So Jesus reveals what God is like, including and especially the cross. Now wrap your mind around this. When we speak about the Messiah being crucified, do we then right away translate that into God was crucified? God dies? How do we make sense of that? In the Last Supper, when Jesus is explaining this new covenant, this new arrangement, that word covenant, along with the word kingdom, were two important words for the Jews. And to summarize them simply, a covenant is a relationship. A relationship between a husband and a wife is a covenant, an agreement. Promises are made. Jesus reveals that more than anything, God wants to have a relationship with us. Now, in Old Testament covenants, there was typically a sacrifice made. Uh, a common practice uh, when people would make an agreement between people, we sign contracts, but they might actually cut their hands and then shake hands, and then the blood would mingle. My blood will become your blood. We are both saying this blood symbolizes that we are one in this agreement. And if anything but death should keep us from fulfilling that promise, then we are dishonoring that covenant. So this mingling of blood. And of course, the lamb was a, a part of this ceremony, this symbol, a, a sacrificed lamb, was always presented to, to stand between God and his people. And it had two ideas behind it. The idea on the one hand of the, the price, as it were, that we must pay if we're going to have a relationship with God. But secondly, the price that God must pay to have a relationship with us. When Jesus says, this is my blood of the covenant, hear him saying, this is God's blood, God's sacrifice in order to have a relationship with you. This is what I see in Jesus. I see Jesus saying, I am willing, God is willing to be in such a close personal relationship with you that it will cause him to suffer. It will uh, demean and hurt and, and, and make life difficult for him. Now think about it. Could you imagine if you had to have a relationship with someone that had hurt you terribly? If you have to forgive someone who has hurt you, it costs you. A part of you has to die in order to build a relationship with that person. What we see in Jesus is God being willing to stand side by side with prostitutes. Of course, the religious leader said, no, 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 God's, God's holy. He can't be in partnership and relationship with prostitutes or any other sinners. Tax collectors, you have it. God remains separate. And Jesus says, no. When we see Jesus in this book, we see Jesus stepping right in and paying a price for having a relationship with us. That price goes all the way to being willing to die. God is prepared to die in order to rebuild a relationship. Now, can God die? We're getting into a, the realm of how do we even figure that out? I can't explain it. All I can say is this. Something in God dies to have a relationship with me. And that tells me a lot about what kind of God he is. 
I can imagine we come up with our pictures of God where God has power and force and, and, and swords and armies and, and just scary and wrath and, and we're all cowering because God is powerful, right? Well, who would have ever expected a God to show up and say, I'm going to carry the cross for you. I'm going to suffer and die for you. And every time you eat that bread and drink that cup, you are reminding yourselves how much God is willing to suffer in order to have a relationship with you. I could appreciate a God like this. I have a harder time respecting or honoring. I mean, I might fear a God of power. And I might cower before a God of power. And I might think I have to out of duty. But the God that Jesus Christ reveals to us is a God who comes to us in our mess and our brokenness. He says, I know all about you. I know what you did this week. I know what you're hiding in your heart that no one else here knows. I still love you. Jesus makes the most important description of God. Not holy, not wrath, not judgment, not judge, not king. Although those are all, I'm not denying them. But the most important attribute that he repeats again and again is Abba Father. Count how many times God is called Abba Father in the Old Covenant and compare it to how Jesus changes the language as it were and teaches us to relate to God first as a loving father as one who comes to us in mercy knows our sin and failures but says I will not treat you as your sins deserve this is the picture of God that I see in Jesus and it drew me it's, it's what I call a heartbreaking, heartbreaking portrayal of God's love that won me over. And I know what some of you are thinking. What does that mean that God is not holy, that God is not wrath? Well, I'll get to that in a minute, but I don't think we start there. And when we're doing evangelism, the worst thing to do is to go up to someone and first lay out before them God's wrath. Because that's not how Jesus came. He stepped down, joined sinners where they were. Neither do I condemn you. Yes, I know, go and sin no more. But he did that in relationship with them and not from a distance saying, first repent and then. We'll get to the second part, but please feel, sense, taste the priority of God's love. We live in a world that does not first start with love and grace and mercy. You have to prove yourselves first. And there's all kinds of messaging and people who will tell you you're not good enough. How many children are growing up with a sense of unworthiness and being unloved and unvalued? And God just shakes his head. These are my children, first and foremost. I created them. I love them. For God so loved the world is how it starts. That's why alongside love or father, the word love is the most prominent word used to describe God through Jesus and the disciples. God is love, says John. He doesn't say God is wrath or God is justice. We understand the wrath and the justice of God because of His love. I've made my point. This is the main reason why I wear this cross, to remind me that no matter what, no matter where, no matter who, no matter anything, First and foremost, I am loved by God this much. Okay, next point. Mark 15, 33 through 39 unpacks how that love manifests itself on the cross. So we're going to see a portion of the cross scene and the impact that that has on one person in particular. So let's watch Mark 15, 33 through 39. At noon, Darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, Lema Sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
When some of those standing near heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion, who stood there in front of Jesus, saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. So you'll remember what the theme of Mark is. Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And twice, both at his baptism and at the transfiguration, God declares, this is my son whom I love. Mark chapter 8, Peter declares as a good Jew, you are the Messiah. That's the first half of Mark's theme. But as we saw last week, they didn't understand what that meant. They didn't understand the cross. The cross confused them. That's not what a Messiah is supposed to be like. Here in this scene, we see the second reason why I am compelled to believe in um, God and in Jesus. And that's because through the cross, it tells me about myself. Now let me explain this. It's not apparent. I've circled one of the guys following Jesus here. I want you to think about the centurion for a moment. I could have used different characters, Peter, the women, whatever, but let's, let's just use the centurion. He was either of Roman background or trained in the Roman way. The Romans had a very clear understanding of what Son of God meant. They called Caesar the Son of God. And Caesar demonstrated that he was the Son of God by exercising power and authority through the armies. They came in power. They crushed resistance. They destroyed the temple in 70 AD. They, they just get rid of all their threats against him. That's how you knew that this was the Son of God. He came in power. Power was the key. And so you have this man trained in Roman power and the Roman understanding of power. And then he witnesses this guy claiming to be king, being beaten and mocked and not fighting, not resisting, not calling an army to defend him, but simply absorbing all of the abuse. We don't read that in Mark, but he probably heard when Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Now, for some reason, and we also read elsewhere that at one point, um, how the soldiers are all mocking him, but eventually something happens. Something convinces him that there's something different about Jesus. What is it? He didn't see power. He saw weakness. He didn't see anger. He saw humility and love. And something in him died. All of his thoughts about power, all of his thoughts about how to make it in the world, look out for number one, take care of yourself, were exposed. And in the cross and in Jesus, he was humbled. Humbled to the point where he would be willing to be shamed among his peers, the other Roman soldiers, who were laughing and mocking. And he's willing to say, uh-oh, this guy really is the Son of God. Not like Caesar, but in a way I never imagined. You see, this is where the justice of God is revealed. The justice of God does not come in smacking us around, beating us up and destroying us if we don't fall into line, but breaking our hearts through grace, humbling us through mercy, exposing our own will to power and thirst for being on top. 
Every time people experience Jesus, something inside them is challenged. Some of them don't want it challenged, and so they walk away. They keep their walls up. They refuse to repent. But others sense that there's something right about Jesus that exposes that which is wrong in me. You see, the mercy of God also reveals the justice of God. God is, uh, God does have wrath. Let me be totally clear about this. God hates sin. God hates not just this nebulous concept of sin, nor our short list of what we think are sins, but God hates every aspect of injustice and racism and greed and lust and all of the many subtle and sinister ways that they distort and mess up our lives and cause harm to so many people. Man, God hates sin. He hates it so much that he was willing to endure the, the brunt of that sin and Satan's fury on the cross. The cross tells me how serious sin is. And not only everyone's sin, not this generic sense we're all sinners, but when I stand before Jesus, and that's what happened when I was reflecting on Jesus, I came to the same conclusion as a Gentile, not a Jew, that in Jesus I see myself. He reveals the subtle and sinister ways that I am greedy, selfish, lustful, violent, hurtful. Oh, we're very clever at concealing these things, but not when we're with Jesus. And so I do believe in the seriousness of sin, but I believe that the way that God exposes it is by hanging on the cross and showing us His pure love despite our impure hearts. What the cross says about me. For that centurion to make this claim would totally turn his life upside down. I think for us to make the claim that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, ought to turn our own lives upside down. It's why you will often find me saying, stop trying to judge other people for their sins. Not because they don't have sins, they do. I can tell you their list is longer than you or anyone knows. But you've got enough to work on in yourself. You've got a long list yourself, and yours may be different from someone else's, but you need to be on your knees as much as the next person, whatever category or side or group they're labeled as. You see, Jesus reveals us, and he does so not to hurt us, but to help us so that we can learn the truth. So the heart convicting call to repent. This felt true. I, I know what feel-good religion is. You maybe do too. There's a lot of people who like to pick and choose aspects of religion that suit them and that affirm what they are and deny what they're not. We all shape our religion and our faith in a way that somehow works better for us. We can justify our wealth. And we simply say, yeah, well, Jesus didn't mean sell everything, and right? We feel good about ourselves. But then we ought to condemn others because of what they're doing. Because that, Yeah, but it says in the Bible, I'm going... We are a messed up bunch of people. And he's still willing to sit at the table with us. That leads me to say, well, this is a God I can love and follow. And a God who doesn't just tell me what I want to hear and make me feel better about myself, but a God who is willing to enter into the dark spaces of my heart and help me change. Which leads to my last point. You're all wondering, what is Aikido? Several people ask me this. Let me explain the Aikido way. It is a modern Japanese martial art, a form of martial arts, developed by a guy named Morihai Ushibi. Don't need to know that, but what you do need to know, the word Aikido literally means the way of the harmonious spirit. The theory behind this model is you do not give in to the anger and violence within yourself. Instead of cultivating a violence or aggressiveness, you overcome that in yourself. You defend yourself only by protecting the attacker from injury. It is a form of self-defense that has the concern for the well-being of the attacker in mind. It's a form of combat, but not one that seeks to beak, beat the attacker. Now, I don't know how to explain it. I've never studied it, but when someone was explaining it to me, I thought, that's cool. So if someone comes at you at force, 
Your point is not to somehow return force and make them hurt, but you try to redirect their force in a way so that it deflects away from you but doesn't hurt them. So it's a form of um, managing the violence and anger and helping them learn through the process that violence is not the answer. I can't get into it now, but you do not respond to violence with violence, but you turn it on its head to try and overcome the violence. Now, to me, this Aikido way gives us a sense of how God deals with sin and violence and injustice and evil in the world. And so I call that the Aikido kingdom. The cross tells us not only how God loves us and not only how we are sinners in need of mercy, but also how God is going to take back this world. How is God going to make this world a better place again? It is when all of us join with Jesus in carrying the cross. Not returning violence with violence, not cursing those who curse us, but forgiving those who curse us, blessing those who attack us. And in so doing, we actually reveal to those who are giving in to violence how unfruitful, unhealthy their way is. It doesn't always work. Jesus died for it. But as this Roman centurion discovered, there's a power in self-denial. There's a power in forgiving. There's a power in serving your enemy that overcomes and is even stronger than the power of evil itself. Um, I read a story this week, and maybe, you, or I saw it on the news. On February 6, 2019, a transport truck hauling milk slammed into the back of a farm tractor near, near Elmira. The uh, farmer, an old order Mennonite, Daniel Martin, 46 years old, who lived in Elmira, was pronounced dead, uh, leaving behind a wife and seven children. And this just came to court this week. Um, this was the family statement when they made their impact statement. We want the driver to know that the whole family does not hold anything against him. And if there was some negligence in watching traffic, we forgive him for that. We hope he does not need to go to jail and he can get on with his life and forgive himself. Now, if you understand the Old Order Mennonites, they were a part of the Reformation who said, we need to take Jesus seriously. They focused in particular on the Sermon on the Mount and on the life and teaching of Jesus. And so they concluded, for example, nonviolence. They will not join the military and because of their commitment to follow Jesus through on this. And forgiveness, they're often in the news for having forgiven people who murdered or hurt them. The judge makes this comment. It's not unusual that a family who suffers like this would want to have some sense of vengeance in a courtroom. It's completely understandable in most circumstances. But that doesn't tend to be the way of the Mennonite community. And I thank them for the way that they have dealt with it. There is power in the Aikido way, in the Jesus way, in the way of returning grace for anger and violence. That's what Jesus says to me. That's what I'm drawn to and why I believe this. Now, let me finish by saying it's not because I do this. It's not because I have an easy time forgiving people who hurt me and I have an easy time giving the, the extra, going the extra mile. I struggle with it. I don't find the teachings of Jesus easy. I find them desperately hard to the point of impossible. I can't, Jesus. But they sound so right. And when I see them enacted by other Christians, I go, yeah. Don't you? Don't you say, yeah. That's what we need in our world. More of that. More of the Mennonite way. No, the more of the Jesus way, however we do that. That's the Aikido kingdom. And that's what Jesus is inviting us to. I've been focusing on the Gospel of Mark because I wanted you to come face to face with Jesus as Mark presents him. From beginning to end, it's all about seeing this radical, contrary, not the Jesus we expected, Messiah. And I am not here 
trying to make you believe what I believe. I am not here trying to tell you that you need to become a Christian. Uh, you need to join a church. You need to do profession of faith. But I am saying that in this series, Jesus has been looking at you and saying, what about you? How do you respond to me? Will you follow me? Will you admit that you can't, but do you want to? And I hope and pray, no matter how old you are, you hear Jesus saying, look at me. Come to me. I've covered all your failures. I've shown you how much God loves you. I will walk with you through this difficult life and give you strength for today, bright hope for tomorrow. I will show you how to make this world very good again. And it's not the way you think. But together, we will turn this world right side up. Come to me, says Jesus. That's the invitation of the Lord's Supper. So we are going to now turn to that. Next, please pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, you want me to join with you in the mission of the cross. Through the cross, expose the depth of my selfish heart. Impress on me the depth of the Father's love and help me to love and serve others with the same cross-shaped love as you. Amen.